So welcome, Frederick, to um, Product of the Working Class. How are things in Sweden today? Uh, it's good, thank you. Thanks a lot for having me. I'm, uh, I'm not working today, so it's a good day. <laughs> so I had a, a time off from work for like six or seven days, so I've been just been lying on the couch, uh, watching TV and just relaxing. Sounds, so it's sounds, been, like, sounds like a good plan to me. Sounds like a lovely yeah, idea. Is. Yeah, it is. Once Excellent. in a while. Uh, oh, yeah, we've all got to do it every once in a while. We have to. Yeah. It's, it's, it's important to have downtime. Really important to have downtime. Um, so obviously it's uh, getting nearer to autumn over in, in Sweden, um, but the weather's still quite nice. And I know that's, uh, that's how you like it at the moment, which is good. Um, yeah, it is. Yeah, so that's that's kind of that's kind of nice. Um, let's just start thinking about drumming. Hence why we're here today, yeah. which is which is really cool. Um, and if you're happy, I'm just going to jump straight in and ask you really what got you uh, started playing drums. What was what was the that key moment for you that said, "Oh man, that's what I want to do." I, I can't really remember what started it. I just remember I've been, uh, uh, my parents had a photo of me when I was like three or four. And I was sitting with headphones and just uh, banging on a pillow with sticks. And just uh, banging on a pillow with sticks and listening to music. That, that was it. So I always, you know, always been attracted to drums. But uh, I could never play it until I was about 13. Because, you know, I, I played a lot of other instruments as well. I, you know, tried playing guitar, the violin, keyboards. And it wasn't until uh, uh, I was 13 that I was actually able to, you know, able to start playing drums. It was one of those, uh, I think it's called like youth clubs. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of those in Sweden, or at least we had a lot of those. And they were all over. Playing music for free, basically. So I just started when I was 13 with a bunch of my friends. Just, you know, learning to play the basics, we played punk covers at first, mm -hmm. and, you know, a few Black Sabbath songs, the easy ones, and, you know, that's just how it started. Awesome. And that's really cool. So did, obviously, if you were, like, like the whole punk and and Black Sabbath thing, did, were, were they that, that sort of style, or particularly well, in Sabbath, were, was that something that drew you towards metal and that harder edge of rock was that something that kind of influenced you fairly earlier early on in your drumming well i think the, fir the first band i fell in love with was kiss oh i love kiss and you know i, I think everyone in uh, in sweden that are born between 1971 and 1975 mm -hmm. have a relationship with kiss i mean they were like one of the biggest bands that were on every poster and every 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 music magazine and everything and I just remember I was at a relative's house and I had a relative, he was, I think he's like two or three years older than me. And I was six or seven. I went into his room and would just kiss posters everywhere. And just came in and stood there was like, oh, what is this? What What is this? I, I need to be a part of this. And he started telling all the stories Well, you know, this is the demon. He was hatched from an egg. He was like, wow, really? So, you know, it's amazing. <laughs> Brilliant. And that's everything. I mean, they were just such a, uh, such a good band to get into. I mean, they, they, they had the whole package. Yeah. So, you know, it just started from there. And then I discovered uh, Iron Maiden pretty early on, Metallica as well. And uh, uh, just... A few of the thrash metal bands and then eventually got into black sabbath around 12 13 and that's that's it it's been on that way since pretty much you know it just it hooks you in though doesn't it there's something i don't know what it is and, I, and this is it's interesting because everyone i've spoken to 
um, through these series of interviews, they've all had somewhere along the way either Kiss or Iron Maiden or you know Van Halen or some of those really big bands that have had such a big impact on things have played a really important role in how they've developed and moved forward. And I, yeah. and, I, and I genuinely think that, that it's it's really cool to hear that. And I and you know it's that it's that fraternity that we belong to uh, as rock and metal lovers that brings everyone together, uh, and that appreciation for that. And I think it's um, it, well, it's a testament to the to the music. That without doubt, there's, you can't take it away from that, can you? No, I think it's just. Uh, I mean, I think the first. The first time you discover something like that, it is so, so pure in a way. So you know, it's just it's as you said, it's just like rooted in you. It just it's it's so deep. I mean, I still I can't really agree with everything that Kiss says and do nowadays. I can't really agree on you know them selling coffins and air guitar strings and whatnot. But you know, it's, it's still when I see like a Kiss, I see the Kiss logo. It's like oh. oh there it is or something and you know everything comes back and it's just so yeah I, it's it's part of the dna in a way yeah i got so we got to start into our into your career um where you where you were uh, but what was the first what was your first band that you got into and when you started jamming you know and feeling like oh yeah this is this is really cool and this is kind of clicking with with those guys that you were jamming with I mean, I think it's just probably the first band I had. We we didn't do anything. We didn't play any gigs or anything like that. We just the whole thing of getting together and creating something. And you actually, this is something I can do. And we just from that up, from I was thirteen or fourteen till I was about nineteen twenty, just you know had different projects and everything with friends or uh, just starting out just just learning mm. and you know developing and uh, I mean it's just uh, it, it took a while to find some people that actually were uh, willing to sacrifice things like time yeah. and everything like that I've been always always been like very focused on what I was, on what I've been doing, in a way that's kind of, I don't know if it's normal <laughs> compared to other people. I mean, I'm, there might be, you know, a few leather leather combinations rolling around in my head, you know. But you know, it's, I mean, I get things done, so I mean, it can't can't be a bad thing. No, I think you're right. I think if there's any any success to be made in music, whatever, whatever it is you know whatever your whatever it is that floats your boat turns you on whatever i think you've got to have um you've got to have a focus and be driven to want to do that because you can't go into it half-hearted it's not something you can go oh yeah i'll, I'll do that and i'll do it. you can't you can't it's you've got to be all in you know i think yeah. and, and everyone's got to have the like the same mindset and be you know that they're they're wanting the same thing you know yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think it helps if you're slightly autistic in a way, and I, th I think a lot of musicians are. And I have, as you said, if you want to, if you want to achieve something, I mean, look at I'm, I'm not comparing myself to any philosopher or anything, but think of all the people that have created something in the in history. I mean, the world autistic or, or a bit of loners. And people who actually, you know, sacrificed everything, yeah. more or less, just for I need to work on this. This is what is what's what's important. Nothing else matters, and that's how you get results. Mm. Yeah, no, so it's, it's, it, uh, no, I, I think that's a, I think it's a valid point. I really do think that's an absolutely valid point, uh, without a doubt. I think you know you've, it's that, you know, you know where you want where you want to be, and I think that's. That's the thing. If you take take Steve Harris from Iron Maiden, I've just been reading his um, autobiography, actually, or it was a not his autobiography, it's a biography about Iron Maiden. Um, but it's interesting reading the, the early chapters about him and how 
focused he was on what he wanted you know and if there were people that didn't fit into the mold then they were you know they were chucked out and it was other people yep. brought in and t- until they found the ones that wanted the same thing and i think that's that's what it has to be like you know it has to be like that you know um, yeah it's got to it's got to be like that you know and i think that's in, in, it's really important it's no different than with with pete chris from kiss is it you know he got to that point where you know the the missus was giving him a hard time all the time about practicing and everything like that and he and he ended up it was you know he was out of the band which is when eric carr came in you know so when you, you it's the it's that principle it's that's it's that whole thing you've got to have that you know paul stanley and gene simmons are both very driven guys in what they wanted to achieve in a time that was very difficult you know when they grew up um it was hard so yep. yeah and if you that's right if you want to if you want to make a make a statement you got to go for it yeah definitely. exactly yeah definitely got to go for it so that that's so band wise that's all that's all you know quite cool what was the what was your first drum kit out of interest my first drum kit was uh orange toma in could have been imperial star or swing star i can't remember it was orange and it was nine pieces wow so it was like uh double bass drums five toms two floor toms i I mean it's just it's, it's too big (laughs) <laughs> but but I got it I got I got it for for really a cheap price and I uh, I didn't have it that long <laughs> because <laughs> I sold it after a while it was just like it's just too big I have no idea why I bought it but it's because uh, it looked impressive I ha- I have no idea I mean I think it was just we shared a rehearsal space with someone that wanted to get rid of the drums. So it's like I gave you a fair price for it. It was like, yeah, fine, just I'll take it. Yeah. So I think I had it for like a year, maybe oh. before I sold it and bought something else. Yeah. So do you have a, a preference now for um, when you're playing? Is there a certain type of kit? Is there a certain size? You know, I mean, it's varied from everyone I've spoken to. Is there? But have you got you know certain things that you think are oh, like must haves, you know, when you're when you're playing live or you know, because I know it's different rehearsing, but from a lot li- from a live perspective. Yeah, I mean, I kind of I have a quite small kit. I only have like bass drum, tom, and a floor tom, so like four piece kit. Uh, I need need at least a twenty four inch kick drum, so twenty four, thirteen, sixteen, maybe eighteen. Just you know, it's nice to relax, mm-hmm. so you can have your arm on it when you're not playing. <laughs> but that that that's about it. I mean, I'm I'm not that picky on what I I can play on pretty much anything. I mean, I can kind of learn, uh, kind of adapted over the years. You know, playing different festivals. You know, just fly in and was like, well, this is your kit. Mm-hmm. It's like, ah, what are you gonna do? It's a uh, it's like the, the tip, typical kit if you're playing like a German metal festival. It's like the 20 inch kick drum. It's like, ah, what is this? It's too small, but you, <laughs> you can't do anything. You can't bring your own bass drum. So, you know, no. you just have to adapt and work with it. So is it but, when you've when you've played like um, festivals, just as an, exa- as an example, I mean, I know I've, uh, I've not played festivals like that, but uh, usually the rule of thumb is, you know you have your own symbols and you have your own snare you know and that and pedals and that's perhaps swapped in and out depending on who's playing the kit is that general rule of thumb have you have you had is that what you've done when you've you know come in and you've been on a bill of a few bands and you've got a a house kit that's on on stage that you're using the core of it if you like yeah i mean i usually bring the one thing i usually always bring along is the snare drum mm. for some reason i mean i can i played so many festivals that they have like, well, we have, they have like four or five different snare drums and they all sound like shit. It just, and it just, it's just annoying sitting and playing. It's like, what is this? It, it doesn't matter what you do to it. So I tried to bring my own snare drum at least. And if uh, it's a possibility, I try to bring cymbals. 
you, you usually if you play uh, festivals, they email you in advance, and they were like, so what kind of symbols you want? And we're like, I like uh, Paiste, I like these sizes. And then you come down to the festivals, it's another brand and it's uh, different sizes as well. Mm-hmm. So if you, I mean, I I like big symbols. Okay. I, you know, I mean, I like 17 inch high hats, 22s, 24, 26, or as big as possible. And if you play a festival, it's usually like 13 inch high hats, 18, 20, and a 20 inch ride. And it's just like, this feels so wrong. <laughs> it's, it's like some something is missing. And you know, I, you know, I, I, I don't like small symbols. No, it's, it's interesting to hear that because I mean, people I've spoken to or drummers I've spoken to, um, virtually every everyone has said they like, you know, a 24 inch bass drum. That's a, as a standard for them. Um, yeah. with the same size toms as you've been saying as well um and lots of them like um an 18 inch crash ride or a 20 inch crash ride so you can get that nice kind of trashiness coming through if you're going to use that in a in a chorus section or whatever but still lift it up but you can still maintain so it's not just lots of lots of kind of noises conflicting with each other you know it's it drives straight through um but yeah. rather than having to but it's interesting you saying that because um about having large larger symbols because um that's not something i've ever really me personally i've never um uh experimented with that if you like um so it's interesting hearing you hearing you say that so what is it about having larger symbols that are what you would choose to use if you were able to i mean i think it's more more to work with okay in in a way and I think it's just, it's a bigger, I can just like the whole sound of it as well. If you have like smaller symbols, you just get like, and I, and I, I understand why people like it, but you know, I've never been comfortable with that because oh, I always been, I always been, uh, like a really hard hitter. Mm-hmm. I don't have, I have like zero technique and I'm just like someone said to me once in a while you know you play like a drunk blacksmith i think it is <laughs> i mean he has a point in a way <laughs> but, but I'm, i mean i just kind of like it as, as well it just feels feels better to hit a really really big symbol and you have more to work with yeah so that, that's the whole idea and it just it just feels more comfortable and i mean i've been used, used to that so yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's no, and I think that's, that's it's fair enough because, you know, as guitarists have preferences about guitar, you know, a certain type of guitar and how that's set up, there are so many combinations with drums. I don't, it's not just, you know, there are, isn't just this one standard thing. It's not in one position. You know, everything can be moved around, different sizes, add-ons. You know that. And I think this is where, like, so combinations really are, are limitless with what we can yeah. what we can do. And I and I think that's what allows drummers to be very creative in in how they approach their their kit, whether they are hard hitters, heavy hit, you know, or heavy fast hitters, or whether they're light and you know lay back a little bit but still hit. You know, there's so many variations in in the approach which is why it's such such a flexible instrument if you like yeah no i agree i agree totally agree uh yeah you know whereas you know a guitarist there's only so many notes there's only so many chord progressions there's only only so you know it's as much don't get me wrong i'm not i'm not um saying that guitarists aren't talented because we we still need them and drummers but drummers are the most important part of the band because we know that um, yeah, we know that because we know that. <laughs> <laughs> but that that structure never changes for them. Whereas you know, if we're not happy with a setup, perhaps we can change it round to make it suit. And I think that's that's the that's the difference. You know, I think that um, well, that's pr- probably what I like the most about it. You know, I mean, 
I'm forever changing how I like my setup. I used to have my two rack toms set slightly uh, to the side, to, to the, the, my left hand side, so I could bring my ride cymbal right in over my bass drum because I liked it yeah. right in front, so I could really dig in and drive it hard, you know. Um, especially on faster songs because it, it was better having more control here than having my arm up here like Nico McBrain because I, I find my arm gets tired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, whereas down here I've got a lot more control over it. And I think this, this is so, um, you know, you start seeing a lot more of that now. I think there's a lot more flexibility. It's not sort of, you know, row of toms or whatever. It's, it's just variety. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, I, I never really got why you have your ride up here. I mean, I mean, I, I used to have it like that when I was younger. I had like, yeah. had a big, big kit. Then you have to have your symbols up there, and just like, as you said, you just get tense after like thirty seconds. <laughs> How does this work? I have no idea. Yeah, because it, so it's just, just you know it's you know it's hard to keep that arm up elevated and yeah. and still get it keep it where you want it. You know. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it just gets, I mean, everything gets harder the older you get. I mean, just getting out of bed in the morning is like a hard work nowadays. I mean, having a ride up here, it's like too too much work. So yeah. to try to keep it as you know, low as possible. And... Yeah, I know. I think that absolutely. Well, that, yeah, I couldn't, agree, I couldn't agree with you more. Couldn't agree with you more. I don't know how Nico manages to do it actually because obviously he's got a ride on his left as well so if his the right arm gets tired he plays with his left which is amazing that the guy's phenomenal um i don't know how well i know he's been doing it for decades so he's probably just used to it but it's just to keep the stamina of doing that is just is mesmerizing actually um, yeah yeah amazing that guy that guy is just well force of nature without a doubt without a doubt so um yeah. well yeah so well, well obviously we're just talk I know we've been talking about Nico and things have you um drumming influences for you so have you ha what drummers have got have you kind of maybe seen or heard or and gone oh, I really like what they're doing I'd like to try and be able to play something like that or there's some something about them that has inspired you in some way to move your drumming skill forward has there been any have you had anyone like that Rose. Come on, kick it back in. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Don't go there. <laughs> Damn it. Oh no. <sighs> Bollocks. Here we go. So as we were saying, we were talk we were just talking um, a moment ago about influences uh, from other drummers. Um, yeah. And, and have you, you know, in your in your drumming experience, has there been anyone in you know that has got you've gone? Oh, I really, really do want to be like that. I want to play like that, or perhaps a certain technique that they've used. And you think, oh, that'd be really cool to have that in my in my playability, if you like. I mean, I think Bill Ward from Black Sabbath is the quite is a, is, is the obvious one. Mm -hmm. I think that you know he's my uh, f favorite drummer of all time, hands down. In just everything about his playing, um, it's very. I mean, I listen to him a lot, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, a couple of years ago when just the drum tracks from certain songs came out on YouTube, I just been sitting, you know, just listen to what's his playing on children of the grave it's like doo -doo 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 -doo. it's like oh i didn't hear that on the album it's brilliant uh, it's like the so so stuff he does i think it's just brilliant and you know him just uh playing as a, uh, you know as a musician along with everyone else just you know instead of being uh i mean i mean i love acds you know phil rudd is great but you, doo -doo 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 -doo. that's great too but Bill Ward's, I mean, he's just so special in with what he does. 
just like you know how how it works you know in the rhythm section and just everything just been very mm. very inspirational and just black sabbath in general on how they wrote music uh i mean that's that's still in you know in the dna how, how you make a song how you make a song interesting mm. like you have different layers shades of everything and you know it it can't be on you know on the same volume every the whole song yeah you know th- there has to be dynamics or else it's just yeah and I, it's, and it's I, not as fun yeah no but i think you're right and I, it's, it's interesting as well how you know you often hear you know some some of the guys i've spoken to and others you know you hear you often hear names like keith moon or john bonham and you know you hear uh those sort of really big names and 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 Bill Ward, not that, I'm not saying he gets overlooked, but actually I don't think sometimes he gets as much recognition as some of those other drummers from the same sort of time. But he he really should do, you know. Um, yeah. And I really do think that, especially when you think about the early, um, the birth of metal and where that all came from, and rock and where it came from. It's, you know, when you think about, I always think about them as the forefathers, you know, you know Zeppelin, Purple, and sabbath they, they were the ones that kind of started the ball rolling if you like for where we are now and um yeah i think i do think he often gets just pushed to the side a little bit i ju- you know um, and i and he shouldn't ever no, i mean i think i think a lot of the other drummers from that era you know i, I like them as well you know i like mm. bonham i like ginger baker I like hit moon mm. but bill ward didn't have that uh uh, insane personality that the rest of them had they were a bit more like bit more of characters I, I mean ginger baker for instance he was you know he was insane for real mm. you know it's it, i think that comes with you know the whole uh, history or the whole myth of them as being drummers i mean john bonham was you know insane as well yeah, yeah. But, you know, so just, I, I mean, I think people talk about them in a different way uh, than Bill Ward, who seems just to be like, you know, this old hippie guy <laughs> who's just like, r- r- you know, writes his poems and everything and just like saying, oh, everything's cool, man. And everything is, you know, very mellow. Yeah. And, you know, Ginger Baker, Ginger Baker was shooting heroin in his eye and neglecting his kids and, you know, being the worst father ever or whatever he was doing, you know. Pulling knives on bass players or whatever, it is, you know. Yeah. I don't think Bill Ward and any any room um, to be a character um, with Ozzy in the band. Anyway, there was only room no. for there was only one room for one character in that band. You know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I think it was probably easier to you know to be at the back and just uh, jam jam along with Geezer Butler and and make sure everything was okay. I I do think that you know let's keep it solid yeah. at the back. You know. Yeah, I think so too. But you know, as I said, he was no, he was uh, he was one of the, you know the big influence. As I said, the other ones, uh, Ian Pace as well, mm. he's a great drummer. Yeah, he is a great drummer. And uh, there was uh, there is still a, a Swedish drummer called Åke Eriksson, mm-hmm. who used to play with a lot of fusion bands, and he you know he played with pretty much everything. And he he was one of the first people I saw on TV. He did tours with just him doing drum solos. Wow. In Sweden. Yeah. And he was like, it's very, it's not just someone sitting at a drum playing a solo. It was, you know, running around in the crowd, playing at everything, people, glasses, pretty much everything. And I saw him when I was, I think it was like 11, 12. It was like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's weird and cool at the same time. <laughs> but, you know, he's, uh, I mean, I mean he's, he's still active. I think he's about 70 now and he's, you know, he's still playing. And, uh, you know, if, if, you know, before the whole uh, COVID thing, you know, you can see him in like small clubs in Sweden, just playing, yeah. still doing drum solos, still play, being cool. Awesome. So, you know, he's a, he's, he was a big influence as well. Yeah, that's, that's cool. I mean, you know, it's it's. I kind of digress because I'm talking about me, and this is about you. Um, how did the whole Angel Witch um, thing come about? Because obviously, Angel Witch have been around for donkey's years. Um, yep. Back right from the beginning of new wave of British heavy metal, 
lineups have changed and everything. So how did that come about for you? What was the opportunity that led, open that doorway for you to come and start um, bringing some thunder to that? I mean, I uh, I used to play in a band called uh, Witchcraft in between 2007 and 2009, I think it was. And uh, the bass player in uh, uh, Angel Witch, Will, he used to work at that label that released our first three albums. Uh, so I got to know him a bit then. And uh, one of my other bands uh, released an album on a label called Metal Blade. Mm -hmm. And he's working on that as, um, with them as well now. He's just working with them now. And uh, it, just, it just came out of nowhere. I just remember I sat at a Mexican restaurant in Stockholm uh, having lunch. And, you know, my phone started beeping. I had a message from him. It was like, hey, man, haven't seen you in a lot of years. Hope you're doing OK. Uh, we're looking for a drummer. Uh, we have some gigs booked uh, pretty soon. You want to you wanna give it a shot, you know, with thinking about recording an album as well. So I was like, oh, I got really nervous right away. And I just okay. remember I had, a, I had a burrito in my hand. And we just, I started shaking because I got nervous right away. <laughs> and and I just I tried to you know answer with with both hands shaking like this, and eventually you know I, I shake that burrito pretty much all over, all over the place, and I tried to eat some and I you know swallow some tin foil and almost started crying so I had to leave, but uh, I just uh, answered him yeah sure why not and he sent me some uh, uh, sent me like twenty songs fifteen twenty songs to learn. And uh, flew out to London. Uh, we rehearsed once, and the week after we were headlining a festival in Germany. Nice. And that's that. And uh, it just uh, everything just snowballed on from there on. I mean, we had three gigs booked. I thought, well, I don't know how how this is going to end, but you know, at least I I get to play with Angel, which. Yeah, for a couple yeah. of shows. So yeah. I thought like, well, this is, I can't say no to this. So, you know, basically we did one show and then we got uh, offered uh, to do a tour uh, with a band called Electric Wizard. Mm -hmm. While we're in doing that tour, we got, you know, offered to play in Japan. And it was just like, oh, really? And everything just snowballed on and just, just kept going. Cool. That's, it's, it's, it's good that that, and everyone I've spoken to has said the same thing. You know, one door closes, another one opens, and then there's this an extra opportunity because of what's been going on at the time. And I think that that's, yeah, and I, that's definitely been a thread through everyone I've spoken to, um, which is really, which is great. I love, I love hearing all those sorts of things. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's just like uh, things to me. It's just like any, in a way, it's sort of like any any other job. I mean, if you do well at one at one job, people are gonna know that. And, you know, hopefully, I I haven't I haven't really asked why they asked me. I think there should be some drummers in the UK. Yeah, there are a few. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it just to me, to me, it still seems like well, this is a bit weird. But uh, I haven't asked yet. I I mean, I only been with them for five years <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, it's, it's like I'm, i mean you know it's to me it's just like it's a great honor mm. it's you know it's a band that i listen to and you just being able to play with them and you know make music with them is just great yeah it's that it's that um it's a it's a like you said it's an honor a privilege to be asked to do it you know and uh because of what the what they've brought to the table from such an early on stage as we've talked about with how metal it's progressed if you like and i yeah. think that's that's the thing isn't it it's it's that whole that whole thing i was i was talking to um darby todd who um he's played with um key Marche uh, marcello from europe he's done a, done a, an album with him recently and he was been he was talking about he got um so gary moore phoned him up um and I, and i'd asked him to tour with him this is obviously before gary passed away obviously but so uh, and, and he said yeah. um and he said no i'm you know i'm actually in the process of doing some stuff with justin hawkins from the darkness and actually that 
I want to be doing that at the moment. It's not... Um, but bec- even though he actually turned him down, that made Gary want him more. He wanted actually... Yeah. You know, and he was like, well... And he did eventually go off and play with him, which is really cool. But, you know, and I think that's, there's a lot to be said for that as well. So it's interesting, isn't it? You The opportunities that present themselves to you, you take and, and then you... It's how you go, but how you take that forward from when when that when that opportunity arises, you know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, you know, it's all as you said. It all goes back to you know the, those bands I've been approached by before, mm. like like witchcraft. If I haven't played with them, you know, this wouldn't this wouldn't have happened. Yeah. So you know, I think it's like as as you said, everything is connected to each other. So you know, and in in a way, it, it, it is a kind of a in a way, it's kind of a small business. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, that, I'm, you... cer- I'm certainly uh, after with the amount of the guys I've all I've spoken to. That's that's exactly what I's coming across. That it is a very small knit community, and the ones that who aren't arseholes, for want of a better word, um, who are nice guys, they're the ones. They're the ones that continue and carry on. You know, it's it's all about not. Um, how did one one drummer put it? Is not being a dick, you know. It's all about being, yeah. because as soon as you start being like that, no one wants to know. Whereas if you you're a nice guy and you're happy to, you know, people want to work with you, then you know. Or you can be really good at what you're doing, and then you can be a dick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is very true. This is very true. <laughs> <laughs> this is very true but it's that it's that whole thing isn't it um i'm going to ask you and some 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 guys have not wanted to uh, to answer the answer the question it's not a, a difficult question or or um it's more what's the what's the biggest crowd that you've played in front of just out of interest oh i i i don't i don't know really maybe we played uh we played one festival with Angel Witch in Poland that was really, really big. I don't know, maybe could be close to 10,000 people. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Uh, one of my old other uh, uh, witchcraft, we opened and we toured a bit with Motorhead. Mm-hmm. So we played at a, a venue in Stockholm, who is like Ice Hockey Arena. That was, I don't know, I think it's somewhere there. Yeah. So I think around, maybe around ten thousand people, I would say. Yeah. And is that what was that experience like? Is it is it is it a a good experience playing in front of so many people? Nerve wracking. Is it better playing to a smaller crowd, like a club gig? Is there is there a preference for you? I mean, I, I think, I, well, of course, it's nerve wracking. Mm. I mean, I think it's just. Uh, uh, you're always, you know, afraid of messing up. Uh, I mean, I think you, if you play a smaller club, you can get away with making more mistakes, and people won't won't notice. On the other hand, you know, when when you when you're in the middle of a show and you're, you're like, oh shit, I messed up that one, that that thing. Oh, people are gonna hear that, and you hear the recording or see the video afterwards. Like, I can't tell. Mm. So I mean, it's just. Uh, other than that, I I kind of prefer playing bigger clubs. Mm. I can say. I mean, if you play like a big festival, there's uh, you're usually very stressed about it, and uh, I mean the sound isn't always that good. Mm. If you're playing like an outdoor festival, yeah, I mean the sound is just blowing away somewhere. You can't really hear each other, and it's just uh, it's just stressful. But at the same time, it's you know, it's 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 a good thing playing festival. It's always fun, you know, seeing new bands and everything. But you know, bigger, bigger clubs. I would say like five, six hundred people. That's that's what I like the most. That's the. I mean, it's. The... I mean, it's the, this. This is still kind of a connection then mm. with the audience. You can actually see the audience if it's like if it's too many people, you can't see them. I mean, I'm half blind to start with, so I I, I can't see past the third row. Anyway, so. but you know, it's I mean, it's nicer. 
Yeah. Have you have you ever had the opportunity to go to Wacken? Is that ever? I've never been. Never had the opportunity to go. No, I haven't. We are. Uh... Yes, we are booked. I have. I just had to think if we are actually confirmed or. Yes, we're confirmed for next year. Oh, we were amazing. supposed to play there in, uh, well, last year. No, the year before. I can't remember. Two years ago. And, uh, you know, since everything has been postponed. But uh, we are playing next year if everything goes to plan. Amazing. Because that so is it, actually, it be... huge, isn't it? Huge festival. Yeah. I mean, it's like the biggest one in Europe. So mm. I think it's like 75,000 people. And, you know, it's sold out right away. Yeah, but that's the thing. It's such a big deal. It's a massive, you know, a draw for so many people. So many yeah. people. Um, yeah, it's it's just incredible. I, I watched um, some footage from, uh, it would have been a couple of years ago, where, um, and Halloween were playing. And I like Halloween from, like, right back when they first started with Walls of Jericho and those those albums. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was just oh, fantastic. Just love love hearing that. You know, just brilliant. Um, and I think that's that's one of the things I like it. They they're not just about current stuff. They they've it's right across the board. So they bring in. I know some people call it nostalgia, but they bring in those bands that are you know actually we're the ones that've been here for a long time and should be playing at that sort of thing. You know, there's a there's a German pan, band called Bonfire that I've liked since the uh 80s and they 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 did a set and they were just oh it was just great to see them play you know and i thought it was just nice to, that they were part of all of that as well you know yeah yeah i mean limp biscuit is playing next year are they how well, about that yeah <laughs> that'll be interesting I mean, to the, see what fred durst does with that oh well i'm not i think i'm gonna do something else when they play <laughs> if, if we're there then i, I don't I don't, I don't know if we play on the same day yet, but you know, it's. I'm not going. <laughs> no, fair enough. Fair enough. They're, they're not. Um, they've never really been one of those bands I've liked. Um, actually, I never really was a lover of that whole new metal thing that happened in that late '90s, early noughties with, like Limp Biscuit. Well, like you know, Limp Biscuit, Limp Linkin Park. It just wasn't my thing. Just didn't really like it no. that much. It wasn't. Um, yeah. Just that there was something that wasn't the same. It didn't have the same feel or ethos about it that um, what I would class as normal rock and metal bands have. You know, this it was. No, no, no. I can't agree. I, I mean, it's uh, a, a probably age thing as well. <laughs> maybe, maybe. No, I, mean, I think when when they came, I felt I felt like, well, I'm too old for this. And I mean, yeah. I in. Just speaking of you know new music that comes along, I think it has to. Uh, Limp Biscuit, for instance, just one of those bands that didn't have anything. Mm. Uh, didn't have anything classic about them. I mean, I, I kind of like music that are classic and timeless, if you will. Yeah. So absolutely. I think if you have like if you have like a blues-based foundation, then it's a good start. Yeah. Yeah. Or if you have, or if you have something else that you know might draw you in, like I don't know, Ghost, for instance. I mean, yeah. they have like the whole they have they have like the whole package, for instance. Yeah. But, but I mean, as I said before, you know, growing up listening to Kiss, I mean, how can I not like Ghost? Wow. It's just like abs yeah, absolutely. Uh, but it's quite clever because the I can't remember the name of the singer from Ghost, but because obviously he's the main man, he he dresses up like a priest. But every, all the other band members are all dressed in black. You can't see who they are. So if, if someone he doesn't like, he can swap them out. There's no, yeah. um, you know, it's quite clever on that side of things because it's no one actually knows who's behind um, behind the hood, if you like. Yeah. Well, well, well. At least in the beginning. I mean, now it's uh... it's a bit more stable now. I know, but I'm just I'm and I'm being a bit. Um... Yeah. I mean, it's quite. It's a good. Uh... It's a good plan if you want to be like fronting your own band. If like change members whenever you like. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, no, that's no. right. Yeah. 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 I don't want to work. No. I don't want to work with you anymore. So off you yeah. go. No, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> the 
<laughs> I love it. Love it. So where are where so where are you currently? Obviously with um with what you're doing as locked as COVID and everything that we've happened in the last eighteen months has that allowed you to record or you know with and concentrate on other projects? What's that What's that been like for you in over the last year and a bit? Well, I've done uh, almost two albums with uh, other projects. Yeah, I have one one band called uh, Wooden Fields, mm -hmm. and that album is coming out in a month, I think, somewhere in the mid October. And that band was just uh, me and two friends who just been talking before. You know, we should get together and write some songs, mm. and we did that before the whole COVID thing started. And uh, the other guys have has bands as well, and you know when everyone everyone's gigs got cancelled, mm. we said, well, you know, we have time now. Yeah. So we just you know basically started writing a lot of songs and recorded an album. So uh, that's coming out. That's really, I mean, that's yeah. just, uh, I mean, this you have to do what you have, you have to be creative in some kind of way. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first couple of months when the whole thing happened, I was just pretty much depressed and just angry. Mm. And, you know, all gigs we had planned, you know, we had a lot of gigs planned with Angel, which, uh, I mean, hopefully we get to do most of them, but still, you know, it's still annoying. Yeah. So I did that and I have a band called Lungnet, mm -hmm. who is like, well, it's also... I mean, pretty much everything I've done has had that 70s blues baits kind of vibe, mm. you know. There's always a bit of Black Sabbath in everything. <laughs> even even the artwork, I have to say, I think even the yeah, artwork yeah, and the photography. Yeah, I mean, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, I, no, I really, I love the, um, there was, there's only one song by uh, Wooden Fields, which is on Apple Music. That's a yeah. cool. That's a cool song, and that's got a really great groove in it. I do like that. No thanks. Yeah, I really no, I mean, like it's that. Just, yeah, I mean it's just uh, the whole thing. Just the whole recording of everything. Just you know, three of us in the studio, uh, not recording on a computer, just mm -hmm. recording on tape. Uh, just us standing, you know, standing, looking at each, at each other and playing with each other. You know, just few overdubs and then you're done so really so, I mean, just... so super raw super capturing the energy that was in the room if you like yeah i mean the whole album is like that it's just uh, uh yeah as i said raw mm. and i mean it's not in any way perfect because it just like it's the I mean, the tempo goes up and down in different parts. You know, it's a bit faster in the chorus, a bit slower in the verse. It just goes like this and, you know, most like wherever the music takes you and we see what happens. Yeah, that's fair. I, but, that, but that gives it more of that live feel, doesn't it? So it's actually yeah. capturing that essence of what it is rather than it being to click or, you know, someone taking a section out because that's slightly not the same as something else and they cut and paste something and stick it in you know as much as that's great being able to do that it does take away the the not saying there's imperfections but it takes away the personality of the recording i think yeah doesn't it yeah it does i mean it's uh uh the other band i'm playing with looking that we had we used to do that as well just play together on the last album, I actually did did some of the tracks with a click. Mm -hmm. Just trying that for once. I mean, I've never been a fan of playing along to a click track because mm. I think it's horrible. But uh, I mean, I just some songs might actually sound better with a click. Mm -hmm. If it's like uh, short up tempo up tempo songs, it's yeah. kind of nice to you know to have like a stable beat to it. But if you have like a song that's seven minutes long with different parts and everything, just playing that to a click, it just gets, uh, it's just out the band all the way. You know, yeah. it's just boring. Yeah. So, I mean, it's yeah. just like w w whatever the song requires, more yeah. or less. Yeah. That, no, that's I, what I have to do. 
no, I think that's that's fair enough because it's interesting as well. You know, you get a lot of drummers now that play obviously play to a click live because they're using samples or they're using, um, you know, triggers for doing whatever they're you know whatever they're adding into something, and I think it does. It doesn't allow a lot of room for manoeuvre when you're, you know, you don't, you know, you don't get that natural, like you're saying, that movement in the in the song because it has to be so precise because otherwise those other bits just don't work. Um, yeah. You know, if you take so like I, I'm sure I'm sure Maiden all, you know, they'll all be playing in ear monitors and everything like that. But I would be very surprised if everything's played to click. I wouldn't would not imagine Nico doing that. No, because, no, he's not. Because, <laughs> I can tell because why would he? You know, because especially with their time, their time changes, and yeah. the way that, you know they're so varied, you wouldn't be able to match a click to that all the time. You know, and um, I've I've been lucky enough to see him, you know, live a couple of times, and um, the it's natural. And you'll know this because obviously playing in a band, but it's that whole thing. Sometimes the songs are always a bit faster when you're playing them live because everyone's a bit pumped up and the energy's there and it's all. Whereas on on an album record, whatever you want to call it, it might be slightly slower, but it's yeah. always that bit quicker when you play it live because of just that feeling that you get with everybody on stage. You know. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh, I think it's important to have. For me, at least, that it has to be uh, a difference between the album and the live performance. Mm. I mean, an album is an album. Yeah. If people want to say, well, I want the, the, this band to sound like the album. Well, stay at home and listen to the album. Then. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean it's, it's a big difference. I think yeah. once you finish the album, you're not done. Mm. That's when everything starts to me. Yeah. They're yeah. going to take it out and perform it live. You start rearranging all the songs a bit. Mm. What works better in a live environment? Yeah. We're gonna have, we can have a, like a little jam part here, and everything will you know extend the ending, and we end the song like this instead. You know that, that's the, that's just the beginning. Mm. And I think I kind of I always preferred bands that came out on stage and maybe you know took risks. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, if you. As I said, if I, if I want to listen to the album, I can stay at home and listen to the album. I want to hear something completely different. Mm. It doesn't have to be like, doesn't have to be like you know, uh, Mars Volta kind of jams that goes on for thirty minutes, but just uh, something yeah. that you know we can tell. Oh, they they did that there, and that part's different, and you know, mm. at least they they try to do something else. Yeah, I mean, yeah. To, to me, that's just more exciting to watch. Yeah, and I think this is it. This is where, and I think this is where the like this raw energy we've been talking about with with rock and metal bands that they have that other other styles might not necessarily have quite so much because the production is so much in it that there is there is no room for maneuver. It's kind of it's got to be straight down the line. There isn't can't go that way with it at all, like you're saying, because no. there's there's there isn't that flexibility within the track to be able to do that and i and i think you know it loses but that's 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 the essence of of rock and roll isn't it that's what it should yeah. be you know um yeah i mean I, I think so too i mean you have to take chances once in a while i mean some some nights it works some nights it sounds horrible <laughs> and you're sitting on stage being ashamed it's like ah it didn't work out that well did it but you know it's just like those times when it works then then it's worth it you know i mean you have to try new things yeah i absolutely. mean just just playing safe is boring yeah no i agree i i agree i agree completely um i mean i i play to click in the in the studio if i have to but i don't choose to do that it's not something i like i like just like to have the general feel in the within the music you know um nick uh, my the bass player in my current band he's Oh, he's so tight it's just incredible how he plays but it's really punchy sort of um his his bass lines are really nice to jam along to and i yep. think if i if we were trying to if we were trying to play to click together it would lose it would lose that organic feel that we have when we're playing that's that's yep. the honest truth you know it would it wouldn't feel the same 
No, no, I, I totally agree. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And, you know, I mean, yeah, you just have to find out what works for you or what what the song requires. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's just different. Yeah, I know, absolutely, absolutely. So obviously, so the gig's being rearranged. So is so obviously you've got some stuff happening with Angel Witch. Exciting that you've been confirmed for Wacken. That's amazing uh, for next yep. year. Fingers crossed that comes off. A bit like Download. Oh, yeah. Fingers crossed that comes off. Um, so with Wooden Fields, have those gigs been rearranged? Is there? Are you just doing small? Are you just sticking to Sweden? Are you planning to go a bit further no, afield I'm, if you're I'm, able to? I'm, I'm, I mean, this is just uh, kind of a new thing that, okay. since it just happened. I mean, we, we're we trying to find a venue so we can have like a release gig Yeah. sometime in, in Stockholm, but it's just, it's not many promoters want to book gigs right now because okay. they don't, I mean, they have no idea what's next week going to be like, you know, if it's yeah. new, mm-hmm. new rules or anything. So we just... Uh, I mean, we're trying to book a few small gigs this year, mm-hmm. and just see see what happens. Uh, just waiting for the album to come out, so you know, we have something to show show for booking agencies or whatever. Mm. So, I mean, so, so what, what's it? So what? Because obviously now over in the over here in the UK, it's been venues are now allowed to are open, you know, with an audience, not socially distant. Or any of those sorts of things. There's other certain requirements that you've got to have, you know, in order to to attend. But what what's how's it been in Sweden on that side of things? Is it is it what's the you know what are they asking you to to be like to be able to go and play if that's if that's happening? Yeah, I should I should know that, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I just wondered, out of curiosity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I mean, there have there have been like a few smaller gigs. You know, usually people play outdoors. Mm-hmm. And uh, just smaller crowds and everything, and uh, there's you know, there's a few, uh, a few bigger shows booked this year. I don't think they're gonna happen. Okay. To be honest, because I think we're still, uh, well, we're, well, we're not in lockdown, and you know, it's a bit easier nowadays. But you know, there's still too much. Music hasn't really been. Uh, uh, it ha- hasn't been that important, I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot of uh, soccer games and everything else. You know, that's okay for people to mm. gather for. But you know, it's still music. Is just it's it, it's a weird weird country, Sweden. You know, they get uh, the government actually approve a lot of money for people to learn to play instruments when they're younger mm-hmm. but you know just places to play that that's not important mm, okay i mean you know a lot of venues in stockholm closed down during the last years because people were complaining about the noise okay. and stuff like that so it's just it's just been weird i mean if you're living in the capital of a country and you're complaining about noise it's like well move back into the forest you know, how hard can it be? Yeah. I mean, I, I just, I don't get it. And, you know, it's it's a weird, uh, it's very easy to get what you want if you complain nowadays. Yeah. So it's just, I mean, I mean, hopefully, you know, it, maybe beginning of next year, I think will be, be a bit better. Mm-hmm. But I think if you're playing a smaller club now, maybe they fit like 50, 60 people in. That's it. Yeah, it's not, not a lot, is it, at all? No. No, it isn't. <laughs> yes, no. You, it, yes, you get reaction from your from the people who are watching, but it's not the same. It's not the same. No, no, there, there isn't. I, I know it's just like it's been very hard trying to book gigs. I mean, cause, you know, obviously since they open up a bit, everyone wants to play, mm. and the ones that had gigs booked before everything happened, they have to play first. Of course. Because you know, they're standing in line waiting, so yeah, I get that part. So just very few places to play, and a lot of people that wants to play. Yeah, so that it's just a backlog essentially. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So I mean, I'm, I'm just you know, fingers crossed that uh, 
uh, everything gets better next year. I mean, we have uh, uh, a lot of gigs booked with Angel Witch, so hopefully we get to do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I hope so. I hope so. It'd be exciting. So, um, are there are there plans to do some some dates in the UK? Is that something that's going to happen? Hopefully. Uh, well, no, I don't know if I can. Uh, I I don't know how it, how it works now with uh, the working visas and everything. Mm. Since me being a foreigner coming into the country, I don't know how that works. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Um, obviously, since the UK decided to leave the EU, which is such a stupid thing, in my opinion. They should never have done that yep. anyway. I'm not going to get all political because, um, you know, I could get in, I'd get in trouble for that. But, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, yeah, that's there's restrictions have had a massive impact on so many things. So many yep. things. Yeah, it's just... Um, but I just wondered at how, you know, if there was going to be that opportunity for you to, to play over here, you know, that because that would have been... That would have been quite exciting to think that. Yeah, I mean, it would be nice. I mean, we have done like, uh, I don't, we haven't done that many UK gigs. I think we did one in, I think we did like four or five since I joined. Mm. So, I mean, it would uh, see, see what happens. I mean, it's uh, the UK is a quite uh, difficult country to tour in mm-hmm. for, uh, for other bands, mm. more or less. I mean, I, I played a play there with other bands. You know, it's. Uh, I mean, it's it, it's nice. I'm not complaining about everything, but it's it, it's hard. It's hard work. Mm. So I can stand. You know, it's. Um, I mean, it's just. I don't know what it is. I mean, people don't really buy merchandise. I don't know what that is. <laughs> if it, you know, play you know, play in smaller clubs, people come up and just like, oh, it's really awesome really like your show oh thank you you're gonna buy a t-shirt no and they just head, head off to the bar instead it was like hey this is this is our living this is what we're making a living out of <laughs> but you know at least it used to be like that when i play with smaller bands so it could be that as well yeah no but i think you're i think you're right it's, it is merch is such a big part of everything now you know um i mean i remember yeah. like back it back in the day i'm going to use that phrase um so like but you know I, you, it was always need a need a gig t-shirt because it's evidence that you've been, you know, I've yeah. been there. It's not like, you know, now obviously you can document it on your phone or whatever. You know, I was there, Facebook or whatever, you know, Twitter it out, whatever. But yeah, there was something about that, have it, having that gig t-shirt to say you've been there, you know? Yeah, I mean, but I think it's, uh, I think that's part of, you know, I mean, of course, everything, you know, progress and everything with spotify and everything and you know everything is much more available now mm. so it is not as special as as it used to be yeah i agree with that completely i mean i, I the same as you said back in the days you know when you heard some someone was, was releasing an album it was like oh my god it's the biggest yeah it was such yeah. a thrill yeah. and you went to the record store and you listened to it oh it sounds amazing went home put on your headphones it's like uh, nowadays it's like i mean spotify it took a long time before I actually uh, signed up for it. Mm. My, I, I, I like it now, but I still buy albums. Yeah. But but it's still it's it's like going to eating you know Pizza Hut's buffet. Mm-hmm. It's just everything thrown at you at once. You know, eat eat till you puke, more <laughs> or less. It's just like it just gets it's too much information, and people get like, ah, oh, I don't really need to focus on everything you know just like everything is available so it's not special anymore yeah it's become saturated hasn't it yeah and and i think that like you said there's no value on it anymore um and because of that and i well, it's interesting i was editing um a podcast yesterday afternoon of phil martini from a band called wayward sons that i i did back in july and uh, it's coming out on friday and he, and I was just listening back through, and you know, he's saying, you know, it's all about that that throwaway attitude that music has now, because there's no value on it. As in, like when you were saying, you know, you have to go to, you used to have to go to the record shop, and you listen to it, you bring it home, you had to invest your money in it. Whereas yeah, now, money and time, yeah, money and time. 
and it, yeah. and it and it was a whole thing you know it was i you know i can remember i slightly digress but i remember when i bought um seventh son of a seventh son the first time i bought it i couldn't stop looking at the artwork and i couldn't yeah. and, and then it was looking at the in the you know the inner sleeve and then it was looking at what the inside of the of the vinyl had on it and all of those little all the small details that yeah. so it, it was not it was a physical thing as well as being an emotional thing uh it was just everything about it whereas now you know you can search up some random band i don't know that might come from the ukraine let's just say you know and it might be there for you to have a listen to and if you don't like it you're not committed to it because it's oh well, i've listened to it. i gave it a try didn't like it whereas you know before you had like we said you had to invest in it and yeah. i think wh when you've invested in it that's that's the connection you know and i think even more so with rock and metal than probably any other genre um when you have that connection and then you speak to somebody else who feels the same that's the brotherhood that's what it brings that's that the rock and roll the essence of everything that the music brings which yeah. just is just lost because you know if we're on this life's on shuffle you know um yeah pretty much you just and I'm, I'm, i mean I, I, I'm, I'm kind of guilty of that as well having spotify you know mm -hmm. if i'm going on you know, going out for a walk or going to work, it was like, well, I have to find something new. And I might just, you know, listen to something for like 30 seconds. It's like, eh, I'm not having that. Mm. What we were listening to is, okay, volume four, Black Sabbath, perfect. I mean, it's just, it, it's too too much. So I, I can understand in a way why people are uh, thinking like, or having this attitude against everything. But at the same time, I'm old enough to know better. <laughs> I, <yeah. laughs> but i also what i like what what the plus points for it for me is obviously hearing new bands um like i've talked about with eclipse earlier on but it's not just that it's where i haven't been able to perhaps an album that came out 30 years ago that I, for whatever reason i never had a copy of or i just had it on a copy on a dodgy tape from a friend and now i can listen to it as it should have been listened to in it's because the whole thing's on on spotify or apple music whatever it is and yep. i can in, and i can enjoy it for what it was because actually maybe i didn't have the money to be able to buy it back then but now i can and i think that yep. that you know that's it i mean i've obviously the new iron maiden album came out on friday over in the uk i don't know whether that was a worldwide release or what um yeah so I've, I've been listening to that in the car for the last couple of days um you know, and it's great because I haven't been able to go to a shop to go be able to buy it. Um, so, but I've been able to listen to it and have it on the day it came out, you know? Yeah. And that's that. So that side of things is great. You know, that's one of the, a real positive from it, I think. Is it good? I think it's excellent. Um, there's a couple of tracks right in the middle of the album, which are um, very old school Maiden. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, the lead the lead single off of it, "Writing on the Wall." I think that's exceptional. If you haven't heard it, listen to it. And the video is amazing. It's all animated. It's just, it's so good, so so good. Um, yeah. Very poignant to what's been going on in the world in the last eighteen months, without a doubt. It's very aimed. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. No, I think I mean, I, as I said, I used to really really like Maiden when I was younger, but nowadays I. If I'm gonna to listen to me, then I listen to the two first albums. <laughs> but yeah, but that that's fair enough, isn't it? And I think we all have, you know, that's that's what we we listen to those things. I I like them. Partly, I'm I'm listening to it because obviously I'm, I'm hoping to see them next year at download. So I'm, I want to become really familiar with it so that I can really enjoy it and not be thinking, oh, what's this song? I want to be able to know it and and love it for being there in the, at that time. You know, um, yeah. That's that's the that's. Yeah, that's the honest reason. But uh, no, it's good. It is. I like it so far, so good. Um, I'm waiting to hear some more feedback from some other, from some other of my friends who are well into Maiden, perhaps more into Maiden than I am. But uh, you know, it uh, should be yeah. But de give it a listen. Definitely give it a listen. So yeah, because because ob obviously it's interesting because they've got th obviously they've got um, the three guitarists now. You know, because Yannick 
Adrian and and Dave are playing for Maiden. So it's not just the two guitars anymore. It's the three of them. So it does fill that sound out. There's other stuff going on in the background now, which is which I think is quite cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Definitely. No, I'm glad. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a listen for sure. Yeah. You know, see what yeah. see what all the fuss is about. I've seen a lot about it from you know my social media on Facebook mm. and everything. Yeah, um, no, you know, my, my friends who are Iron Maiden fans. On the other hand, they like everything Iron Maiden ever put out. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so every song is the best Maiden song ever written. Really, really, is it that? But you know, uh, not- yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not saying it. I'm, I'm sure it's a, it's a great album. You know, it's still. I'm gonna yeah, give it, it a listen. Yeah. See what happens. It's not as good as Number of the Beast. I will say that it's not as good as. Yeah, that but, yeah, but I mean, yeah, yeah you know, it's. Uh, it's uh, I'm I'm sure it's a great album in other ways. So, oh no, without a doubt, it's great, and I and I have to say, I really love I love some of the grooves that Nico's put down on it. It's it's really good. It's not typically, it's not got that kind of that triplety feel that he plays on his ride cymbal a lot. It's it's kind of come away from that. There's a lot more variation in his in his bass drum patterns as well. So I like that. That is good. It's in it's good to listen yeah. to. So yeah. So well done to Nico for that because it makes it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe his arms got tired, and he's decided yeah, to play yeah, it down. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe that's what it is. So <laughs> you think it's cheap more instead? Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. No, I I can't imagine that for one minute. Ah, uh, brilliant stuff. Ah, <laughs> uh, it's been it's been brilliant today, and I've thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed um enjoyed chatting to you. Has yeah, been, same here. It's, 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 it's been really really, it's really been, fun. fun. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun, and and I know we've had a few um, spinal tap moments today, which has been uh, which has yep. been laughable from my end. Um, it would be great because <laughs> it has been. I mean, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. I think if we get it, it'd be great. Perhaps if we can have another chat another time, that'd be amazing. Um, yeah, absolutely. It was this was really nice. I must say, really fun. Ex- excellent, excellent stuff. Well, that, that's great. Well, I, I promise for the next time I will get a phone that works and a charger <laughs> that works as well and uh, a phone that's not going to overheat and uh, shut down by itself. <laughs> amazing, amazing. 